Jameson, you, this has come up a few times, um, this concept of being influenced and persuaded by the, the beauty of the feminine, right? Mm-hmm. Girls, specifically girls who, you know, hot girls who are walking around. Uh, they could or could not have boyfriends with them or with, you know, at home and they're wearing different clothes or, or you know, some, something you, you feel attracted to. They're, maybe they smile at you or they talk to you, whatever. Smell good, whatever Smell it is. good, whatever it is. And you feel this attraction, right? This is an important topic and this is something that as a society we have to address in a real way. And I, I feel very strongly about this simply because I have never had a guide or any, any guidelines as a framework from how to live life in this way, in, in this concept, like what, whatever this problem is, right? So let me, let me, let, let's set the framework. If you look at the reaction you need to have when you see a hot girl, right? You could base it in categories. You could be married, you could be single, you could have a girlfriend, um, you could be like older, divorced, like it could be anything, right? You could have kids, not have kids. You could be with your kids at that time or with your wife at that time or not be with your, t- you might be at a conference alone and you're in the swimming pool and a hot girl is there, right? Like there's all these situations and there's no f- real framework. The only framework that I can think of is religion, right? So when I had that lunch with Elliot last year-ish, last year, maybe maybe a year and a half ago, right? I, I flew to Florida just to have lunch with him. And one of the things he taught me, and he's like, Farhan, whenever there is a girl around, because I asked him this question, I'm like, look, you're happily married, you have four kids, but like, you know, you're well off, you're fit, you're good looking, like you can have, you know, don't you want like, what makes you not cheat and stuff like flirt around and have an affair? He's like, whenever I see a woman, I turn the other way. It's like no go pathway. It's like the yes go pathway. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes go. And he's like, I look the other way and I do that all the time because that is a temptation that is like and he didn't say this, but this is what I'm linking it to. It's like the apple in the in the in the good and evil, right? The garden of good and evil, the tree, tree of knowledge. And, and the serpent says, here, eat this apple. That apple to Elliot, and, and, and forgive me, Elliot, if I'm misquoting you, is, is akin to that temptation, that craving of granola or Italdo or looking at a girl or Instagram or YouTube. All of that can be somehow frameworked into craving, dopamine, addiction being attached to something so now and 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 by the way just to let you know because you know you do dishes and sometimes you don't know what content to watch so there's a very recent yesterday it came out jordan peterson recorded a podcast about the sexual revolution and hugh hefner is on the thumbnail and the question is re re re-questioning or or rethinking the sexual revolution. Is that good? Or, I haven't seen the podcast. It just came out yesterday. I'm going to watch it. But I'm very excited to watch this because if you look at what Elliot said, look the other way when you see a girl. That's the framework that Elliot has given me. That's the framework that the Bible has given us, that the Quran has given us. Then you look at what is happening in the West. Men are getting married late or not getting married at all. Having kids late having relationships late whereas in conservative traditional societies let's say let's say men got married at 18 19 17 16 and nowadays maybe early 20s mid 20s but then i'm 41 i'm not married i don't have kids i want to get married i want to have kids and I will when the time is there. But imagine at the age of 
20. I grew up in such a way that my parents said, you know what? Here's a girl. This is the girl you're going to marry and have kids with. And I said, okay. By the way, they did try that. And I said, fuck off. <laughs> right? I didn't let that happen. And, and there were girls and, you know, ready to get married and all that stuff. And I said, no, I'm going to fall in love and have marriage that way. I'm going to do it my way through organic traffic, right? Organically. So what are your thoughts on monogamy and getting married and having kids early in age, even though like you're in your, you're what, 28? Yes. 28. So you're 28, not married, no kids that you know of um, might exist. But, um, but, but the, this, this thing, what, what Elliot said about monogamy and, and, you know, look the other way, one, one girl, cause he's been with one girl for the, for his whole life since he was like 14 or even younger, like it was his high school sweetheart and he married her. Right. And so that life what that type of life will do for a person, right? So if you look at someone like Shah Rukh Khan, Shah Rukh Khan is the biggest Bollywood celebrity, maybe the most famous person in the world, right? Because India has so many people and, and he's such a superstar billionaire. He got married very young. All the girls want him, all the girls, right? But he works really hard and makes the, you know, he's made, he hasn't made a good movie in like four or five years, but before that, he was like on top of Bollywood. Right, and we see other men that are successful who were married very young. Mark Zuckerberg got married young, you know, has has, has kids or one or two kids. I'm not sure, but you know, Bill Gates, right? Like you see Elon Musk, right? These guys got married and had kids very young, relatively speaking. But then you have the other crowd, the Dan Bilzerian crowd, right? The Imran Imran crowd, <laughs> which is like. Um, you know, fuck girls and and make money, right? Fuck bitches, make money, and and it's like for the whole, for our whole life, the Hugh Hefner crowd, right? The whole whole life. So, as a society in the West, where do we stand in terms of monogamy? And how has social media played a role in this 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 concept mm. of monogamy? Because if you are watching porn, you have this supra threshold, supra normal stimulus, which you're going to crave all over and over, that might affect the your, your wanting to get married because you want to find that porn star to get married to. And you may try to make a bunch of money because you think money will get you there or mm -hmm. become really, really fit because you think that will get you there. I know this because I was like this. I know this personally, mm -hmm. firsthand experience. Right, I'm gonna become super fit and make a lot of money, and be very, very successful and famous, so I can have millions, millions of women. And a lot of guys live like that. Mm -hmm. But is that framework that social media perhaps is teaching us, or maybe it's some conspiracy, some government, you know, the the far left, maybe it's the Chinese with the TikTok, like whatever it is. How, what role does that social media on a massive scale in terms of Instagram and TikTok play in this monogamy right. life? And what are your personal thoughts on monogamy versus polygamy versus, you know, polyandry, you know, whatever those words are? And has that attitude changed in the last five years? You know this well, because we've, been able to come to understandings with this. And a lot of my learning from this came from you and through learning about no-go pathways, like learning about dopamine, brain connection, and learning about how we have these mirror neurons as well. And there's a lot that comes down for me to the ability to have options. And people see options as social media. They see options as dating apps. The tough part about the options is that right now in our current society is very strong favored to the woman because the men are putting themselves out there and the women think, wow, I have all these options. Men in my DMs, matches on dating apps. I can be patient. I can wait. I'm, it's, this is still going to be here. I'm still me. I know that men want me. So I'm going to do whatever I want to do in the meantime. 
they usually live in the moment they they live with their maybe they focus on their career maybe they focus on you know their friendships and partying and socializing but they are also not in a sense of oh man men aren't gonna want me one day it's gonna be fine but my friends who are you know in their 30s are starting to get a little upset because they're like i want a man i want to settle down with a man i want to have kids i want to be able to be a mom it's very tough for them they aren't having as much ease to do that but these same girls five ten years ago were like man i got so many options and maybe they still do on dating apps i don't think it's exactly their age i just think that there's this sense of oh i have all the options in the world i have all the time in the world but these options aren't really options these options that a lot of people are getting maybe they're attractive profiles maybe they're attractive uh, people who are interested in them who are attracted to them but There's more to relationships than attraction. There's location, there's future plans, there's what you want to do together, there's endeavors, there's taking action versus just flirting and being on the the flirting screen versus actually wanting to be with someone. And I think that's very misinterpreted right now. People are, especially women, are able to see all this attention and perceive it as, oh, I have a ton of options, which they probably do. But a lot of that attention isn't making sense for them it's not going to align with what they actually want when it comes to dating someone if they are ready to start dating someone they just get attention and it feels good attention feels great especially for the feminine feminine love attention so when they get this stroke to their feminine of all this attention it gives them this sense of okay this isn't really a uh, big deal right now this isn't time pressing for me and some women worry about their biological clock. And I think that's a whole different conversation. But just in a societal perspective and a standpoint of how social media is changing that for people, there's a sense of urgency that's disappearing for women. But they don't realize that a lot of that freedom that they're getting, a lot of that realization from all this attention isn't going to be fruition, isn't going to be long term. It's just attention. It doesn't have much value to it. They don't they, they think that, oh, yeah, I have all this attention from these guys. I'm sure I can just settle down with one of them whenever the day comes. But a lot of those guys don't even want to settle down. And yes, maybe they want to use them physically, but also some of them they just like giving women attention. And some of them just want to have that flirt and just be online flirting with these girls and have that reciprocation of attention from a pretty girl and get that swipe right on a dating app. It feels good. They want to feel good like that. But the issue with that is that it's different for men. Men are on a different side. Men are seeing options of women that they're attracted to. They're not getting attention from these women, but they're seeing more options for women. And a lot of the porn now we, we're starting to learn is a lot more fake, and we are coming to terms with that, but Instagram girls is different because they're so perfectly filtered. They look so particular that when a guy has a date with a beautiful girl that he's attracted to, It's not the same as this perfect girl that he saw on the internet. And he's craving that perfection. Maybe in quantity, maybe just one, but there's always a sense of judgment in the man. Of Maybe I can do better. I know there's prettier girls out there. Back in the day, it was just, this is the prettiest girl in my whole village. Now there is no village. The village is the whole world because you can see all these people on Instagram, different races, different kinks, different things that you're interested in, women that are interested in that, women that look like that, women that's body parts look like this. I had a really good friend who had an amazing wife that he loved so dearly, but he was upset because he was watching women in porn and seeing how deep they could go with their throat. And his wife wasn't able to do that. And he was so torn on his marriage because he wasn't able to satisfy that craving that he's had only because he saw it on the internet, only because he knows it exists out there somewhere. And he was so close to even second guessing his marriage just because he said, I want to know what it's like to experience that feeling. I want to know what it's like to have that feeling of being able to get, I guess, throated by some woman that is really good at it, that enjoys it. Because there's women out there that are able to do that. So men are able to pick and choose these different things. He's not looking at all the lovely qualities of his wife that he married to in the first place that he loves. He's thinking about, oh, there's this one quality that this other girl has that I want in my relationship. I want to explore sexually. So men are getting these different options now that are making them realize that, 
hey, there is this out there and there is this thing out there that I want to try and there is someone out there who would be willing to do it. I just got to find them and go get them, which as men know is way, way harder than we think it is because there's so many women that are picky as well and just being able to get out there and get what you want is not as easy as going out and meeting someone and, and trying to go on dates because how are you going to ask for these things right off the bat, firstly? And secondly... How are you going to be confident to talk to a woman in person when a lot of your self-satisfaction and gratification comes from women on the internet who don't give you any feedback, who aren't thinking about you, who don't know you exist, who are on OnlyFans, who are giving you a false sense of realization because you're paying them to say nice things to you. You're paying them to talk to you. If you're talking to a woman or a guy, who knows? But you're still paying someone to feel good about yourself. When you go on a date, that's not how that works. A person can say whatever they want. If, you, if they disagree with you, they can tell you to fuck off. They can tell you they don't like you. They can tell you they don't like the way you're dressing. They can tell you that they are not interested in you, which is probably the scariest of all because it's not superficial. It's just like, oh, I don't feel good with you. I don't enjoy dating you. I don't want to date you again. That's a hard pill to swallow as a man. It's painful. You start to question yourself. You question, am I not good enough? Do I not look good enough? Am I not making enough money? Am I not famous enough? Am I not this? Am I not that? Am I not this? And you start trying to fill those holes with those things that you need in order to try and make yourself as attractive in your mind to a partner that you think is that you think is needed. But women have a totally different ball game. So men and women are playing two different games and they both want similar things. But there's a lot of women out there that want a particular kind of man and there's a lot of men out there that want a particular kind of woman. And logistically that does not that does not work. It doesn't add up like that. There's just no way to make sense of it. And there's always that craving for what if, especially the men who are at that place where maybe they do have their fitness ready and their money ready and they have their fame. And then they wonder, what can I do with this? I love this person. I have a really hot partner, but I have options now too. I have women that are coming to me that are interested in me. You think you see this with celebrities, you know, Shakira got cheated on by her husband. Megan Fox got cheated on by her husband. And it depends on how you feel about those people, if you're attracted to them or not. But those are celebrities that many men idolize. And their partners, who are also men of similar caliber, fame, and looks, and fortune, realized that they had other options. And they decided to explore those options. Even though they had a person that millions of men fantasize over. That is a very pertinent issue with today's day and age. And monogamy and polyamory don't even scratch the surface of what that is doing to us. Because polyamory, when you ask someone who's polyamorous, is basically just trying to meet new people. It's just leading, leaving an open path, right? They're like, I want to have an opportunity to meet someone if I do get along. I don't want to restrict it to one person. That's at least the people who, I, who I've spoken to who practice polygamy, who are saying that they aren't doing it because they're trying to have sex with as many people as possible but they're doing it because they want to leave an open door to exploring relationships in all aspects of life. So monogamy seems almost restrictive to them. They think that because they explore that path with that particular person, that's their person and that's who they are focused on. Now the comparison between the two is very interesting because from a psychological standpoint, there is this need to mate as a man and need to explore sexually but there's also a side of it that we have almost scientifically adjusted we actually have we've adjusted things scientifically with birth control and other things that are able to make it easier for you to do those things without the normal repercussions of a community of being in an environment where hey you sleep with this person and you have to be in that be in that person's life to protect the potential child you have to be in that person's life to protect them from anything during pregnancy. If they're sick, if they need to get food, if they need to be fed, you have this care and compassion for them. With our day and age, with our current medical world, we have decisions that can be made. And it's, it's a very positive thing, and it's very helpful, and it's very beneficial, but it's also very detrimental because it's easy to make decisions that can alter the future of your life with the snap of a finger and you could just decide, Hey, I don't want to have the worry of having kids. 
And then you don't have to worry about that. And then you can go and be able to have partners and and not have to worry about if they're going to stay around to bear those children with you. If they're going to be around to give you what you want when it comes to taking care of the kids, taking care of you while you're pregnant. And we can just shift that right off as human beings because we've developed the science for that, which is very interesting. It's very impressive. But that allows that open path for people to be like, I want to be polyamorous now. You know what? I want to explore these different connections. I want to go and have sexual interactions with all these different women to see what it feels like. Or I want, as a woman could say, I want to go with all these different men to explore what I like and explore what I enjoy. So both of these people are trying to explore and find out more about themselves and, and pursue pleasure and pursue pleasure in life. And maybe they want to settle down one day. Maybe they don't. Maybe they want to do that for the rest of their life and keep that open. But I don't have a decision or an answer for people because, of course, it's not going to be that easy. It's not going to be cookie cutter. It's not clear cut. I know that I personally like developing relationship and diving into that relationship and experiencing new things with that person and building that bond with that person in order to expand on that. That's just because I had a very healthy relationship with my parents. I saw my parents' healthy relationship. I was able to grow up with a relationship that's healthy. My parents always loved each other. They always kissed each other. They always showed affection to each other. They always had positive words for each other. Their arguments were always very constructive and they weren't violent. They were able to build each other up and bring the best out of each other. So that's just the way I was raised, right? So it's easy for me to say that. It's easy for me to say, oh yeah, monogamy works because I've seen it work and it wasn't perfect, but at least that's my influence. That's the way I've been raised. However, most of my friends, if not almost all of them, parents are divorced eventually. There's some kind of divorce between the parents, some kind of split within the marriage. And maybe that changes their perception on things. And then they lose hope. They say, is this exactly what I need? Is this exactly what the world needs? Or maybe it's something else. Maybe we need to change it around a little bit. Maybe it needs to be different. So that is a huge factor as well of what your potential is for what is possible and what you've seen throughout your life. If you're shown on social media that all these celebrities are cheating on their other partners with these other celebrities, then what are you going to think about your relationship and your ability to bond with your partner and love your partner and appreciate your partner? Now, there's also a side of it where I, too, don't want to partake in opening the door to someone else because I don't want to open up jealousy. I'd rather focus on my partner and be able to allow them to learn to provide for themselves if they do feel like there's things that I'm not providing for them, which I think is important in a healthy relationship. But at least they can provide those things either by themselves or communicate those things if they need to bring someone else in for that. However, in those partnerships where you can just open up things and have everybody there, it's almost like instead of looking at your problems, you're just finding another way to solve those problems by bringing another person in the equation. And they can fulfill this need you have. And that person fulfills this need you have. And that person can fulfill this need you have. And it's tough because it doesn't allow you to look inward as much. And that's just my observation as, as a reflection looking in. It doesn't allow you to face those things. When I was in my relationship and I cheated, I could have been in an open relationship. And that would have been fine. It would have been totally cool to do what I did. But I wouldn't have been able to reflect in on why I did what I did. And why I made the decision I did. And how I looked inward to that decision leading up to it, during and after, in order to base my future self and my character development throughout my life. I could have just chalked it up as, oh yeah, this is normal. This is fine. Yeah, the reason I had those feelings were there and that with my other partner and the reason why I did that was there, but I wouldn't have been able to digest it because I would have thought it was fine. I would have thought it was normal. I wouldn't have thought it was a problem or an outlash or an issue that I needed to face head on. It wasn't a, oh shit moment if I were to be in an open relationship. But because it was an oh shit moment, it drastically altered the way I act and the way I think and the way I process my feelings and the way I look for partners in the future. So that is the value that comes with not being able to have all those options open. That is why I chose to be in a position where I could be focusing on a relationship and exploring myself and maybe dating around a little bit, but never getting into a position where I'm going to have a conversation with someone that's like, hey, I really love you, but I want to start doing with things with other people too. I want to date other people too. Because if I have to get to that point, I know for me that there's something I need to work on and I need to look into. Maybe I need a new partner. Maybe that's what it is. You know, it doesn't have to be super deep. 
maybe that person I'm with just isn't doing it for me in that way. But at least I can have that conversation and have that self-awareness versus just trying to solve the problem by adding new equations and new variables into that situation. Got it. You f- away from doing. It definitely doesn't get you closer. It's just, it seems like a step. Right. But it's not a seems step. Seems like, because your seems brain like is step. processing. Your brain takes it as a step, which makes you feel a sense of accomplishment. Moral satiety. Exactly. But the actual sense of accomplishment comes with actually doing it. But saying something makes you feel, hey, I told Farhan that I want to be a YouTuber. That's doing something. That's putting myself out there. Hey, I, People I, buying books and never reading. Exactly. People buying courses. And never... T- uh-huh. Yeah. Because that buying the course is the dopamine. The, the craving is gone because mm-hmm. now you did take a step towards it. Yep. And that's enough for the brain. Exactly. Okay. Now let's talk about caffeine. And this is something... Um, so recently on Huberman, he talked about, uh, he had, uh, you know, something about caffeine, like the whole lecture was on caffeine. And I don't know your relationship with caffeine or how it's been your whole life. I know a little bit, but I don't know the details. But right now, as we speak, um, we came here January 3rd. So about a month and a half, a, a bit more than that, maybe like 50 days. No caffeine for me. Well, no coffee. Of course, I've had cocoa powder, you know, 100% cocoa powder. I've had some Tisana tea, but that's like barely any caffeine, but no coffee. And I was drinking coffee every day, cold brew every day in Merida, three months. Before that in Playa, I was having coffee from Liquid Prana all the time. Before that in Ulis, there was coffee like from, I love Starbucks cold brew. I fucking love it. It's the only good thing they have. I love it. (laughs) Um, Before that in Tulum, I was having coffee at Digital Jungle, you know, espressos every day, double espresso, sometimes put a little bit of Carajillo, it's um, uh, 43, it's like this 43 herbal liquor, it's alcohol, but you mix it with double espresso and it's called a Carajillo. It's incredible, incredible drink. And I was sometimes having two a day, man. It's like a gra- grappa in, in Italy, the grappa, right? It's the espresso with the, with the liquor. So I was having that and my relationship to caffeine is such that when I want to stop, I stop. I didn't w- w- uh, wean off. I just stopped. And I, have 50, I, I don't even think about coffee. That's the interesting thing. I don't think about it. I see people drinking coffee. I have no craving for it. So again, is that just a personality? I just have the genetics for that? Like, I'm, or am I like mentally strong? Have I tricked myself? What's, what's going on? in terms of like people finding it really hard to quit things. And then if you watch Huberman, you know, he he was, uh, he had a recent podcast with someone who is a sleep expert, Dr. Poe. And Martha was watching and she was telling me and, and, and Huberman kept saying, oh, it's so hard to stop coffee. You know, I would stop coffee, but, but it's so hard. And so he has made so many clips about, the benefits of caffeine, right? He talks about how uh, yerba mate has like a glucagon, a transporter, something like that, right? So he has these reasons for drinking coffee. Just like Tim Ferriss in 4-Hour Body, I think he mentioned like coffee is an antioxidant, which might be a total fad of its own, you know, it's antioxidant. Um, so how? what is your relationship with coffee and caffeine in general? And what would you say to Huberman who thinks it's hard to stop coffee, even though he's a neuroscientist, he, he knows so much about, about neuroscience, he knows about addiction, he has mental toughness, he has all these coaches and physicians around him, and yet, is he like lying to himself? Quitting coffee is easy. To me, why isn't it easy for him? And what, what is your relationship with coffee, and how has it been you know, over the last five years? Mm. And do you believe caffeine has benefits for you? I do believe in genetic predisposition and other people having a difference in how their body reacts to caffeine versus someone else, even in the same family. I know my parents drink caffeine every day. And if they don't drink caffeine, it changes them. It's very, very different. I 
have had caffeine. There's been times where I've drank caffeine every day. There's been times where I drank it a few days a week, but it never became... Actually, I don't know if there's times where I've drank caffeine every day. Come to think of it, I've only had it maybe three or four days a, a week max. But I had it when I was younger. I used to get Starbucks, the big sugary Starbucks drinks. When I was in like high school and middle school, it was like a treat that I would get with my mom and it would be Pumpkin super tasty. Pumpkin spice latte. Yeah. I would always get decaf though because my mom was always like, you got to get decaf, which I was fine with because for me it was about the taste. Decaf I didn't still has a little sensation. bit of caffeine. It does have a little bit of caffeine, yeah. yeah. But I still, I did a lot of things for taste. It wasn't for the caffeine. Now, caffeine is the most used drug in the whole world. It's very pop prominent and it's in many different things other than just coffee. Like you said, cacao has caffeine. And I notice myself craving cacao all the time. I love having cacao. Yeah, pre workout Hot cacao. Time. Yeah. I love the, the warmth of cacao. I love the heart opening effects of cacao, the ceremonial effects of cacao. And coffee is an art. Coffee is a very, very powerful art. I was talking to this girl, um, incredible person who's very deep in the world of coffee and the way it's farmed and the way that people are uh, processing the coffee and the way that it goes from this plant all the way and this fruit all the way to the actual coffee bean that you that you see in stores and how the whole roasting process is i think it has a lot of beauty to it and there's a lot of appreciation that comes with it i don't find it super important for me but there are also times where i do want that boost however the reason i don't consume coffee every day is because whenever i get tired i'm curious as to why i like knowing when my body's tired and I like being able to say, hey, maybe I can take a little power nap. Maybe I can do a yoga nidra. Maybe I can do some non-sleep deep rest. Something that will help me, Huberman style, in order to get that benefit. Does that help you? Naturally. Yeah. I feel very reju rejuvenated when I take a meditation, when I rest my eyes. I notice that I yawn a lot. That's one thing I've always just, I think maybe the past five years, Maybe maybe a little bit less. I've just noticed that I always yawn. Of course, I don't have caffeine, but Why? yawning comes powerful to me. It just comes popular and uh, to my current body, and I think it has to do with with air intake. There's something to do with air intake, tiredness, especially at night. I'll yawn a lot. I yawn very frequently, and it's more prominent when I'm speaking, which I find interesting because we know when we speak, we're talking and breathing through our mouth, and then when we don't speak. In and out through our nose. I just made that realization this moment. Every time I yawn that I can remember, it's a time that I'm talking a lot. I'm either on the phone with someone, I'm talking to a person, I'm listening to someone respond, I'm having a conversation with someone. Most of my yawning isn't just random. Like I'm not sitting down and just hanging out and then I yawn. Maybe I'll yawn like that, but a lot of my yawning comes from times when I am using my mouth to breathe and to speak and having a conversation with someone. And is that because they don't like the conversation? I, I actually have had really interesting conversations in the morning or at night with people I'm very interested in and my body will still try and yawn. And I just made that connection as uh, listening, to, um, listening to James Nestor talk about that and the breath and the, and the power of your breath and how you're breathing. And when you speak, you breathe in and out through your mouth. And then shifting that breathing to the nose and giving you more energy. Because I've never done, I never yawned during breath work. <laughs> I've never had an urge to yawn during breath work. But I wonder, because I haven't done an experiment on this, I wonder if caffeine would still cause me to yawn or if my body wouldn't need to yawn or if it's something that is more related to my breath. My body's craving more air, so it causes me to yawn and not use my um, my nose, unfortunately, because yawning is still through the mouth, but at least it's your body kind of craving air. At least that's what I've been told about yawning. It's always craving air. So back to the caffeine topic. Whenever I use caffeine as an enhancement, I feel incredible. I notice it very prominently. I know why it's so popular because it feels great. It's like motivating dopamine. right away. Dopamine. It tastes good. It has this dopamine to it. It smells. The aroma is incredible. So I try and appreciate it for what it is. And 
I don't want to get to a point just like the cake where it becomes something that I rely on every day. With the cake, I could have it every day. I'm an adult. I can make big decisions like that. I exercise. Usually, most of my life, I exercise. So if I had a cake every day, it probably wouldn't do much for me. It may actually be beneficial. It may actually give me more calories that I can use to help with my weight training and and my strength gaining. But I just don't like the idea of having to rely on something every day, which is what I loved about fasting. I loved how with fasting... I could just not eat anything all day. It would just totally help reset my dopamine. And all of these little things, and all these little cravings I would have throughout the day, sometimes I would have a certain snack that I look forward to at a certain time of day. I'd have to take get rid of all of it because I'm fasting. So my body would be dependent on other sources to get that dopamine. So it has to either come from social media, which is an easy switch, pornography, which is an easy switch, or if I decide not to do those things either, I got to find another way to get that. It could be going for a walk. It could be talking to someone I love. It could be spending more time in nature. But I don't have as much access to that 